Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, from Facebook Live. So hopefully, oh, here comes Rebecca. She was a little bit late to the party, but here she is. <laughs> Welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so my name is Rachel. I'm a school psychologist in Maryland, and we're happy to have a great conversation tonight and hope that you guys are staying safe and doing well and everything. But um, I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca, who's going to talk about how to participate tonight. So Rebecca? Yes, hello, everybody. I'm excited to just barely make it. I'm in the uh, state of mind where I'm losing track of time very easily and days and hours. But I'm so happy to be here because this is going to be a great conversation. And I want to tell you how to participate. You are watching on Facebook Live. So please comment on either of the Facebook pages, also on Twitter. And if you use the hashtag Psych Podcast, I will be checking for notifications with the hashtag and on the Facebook pages and on Twitter. So please feel free to comment. And later, if you're watching Not Live, this will probably be posted to iTunes and YouTube. So you can comment also using the hashtag and we can continue the conversation over time. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Eric, who is going to introduce our wonderful guest. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, welcome, everyone. We're excited to bring you a sort of a special um, non-Sunday night um, <laughs> podcast edition. And uh, we wanted to talk about a special guest that we have who's here in Connecticut. So um, <clears throat> our connections come a little bit, um, mine and Rebecca's, because she's a trainer here in the state, and then also has a connection with APA. So I'm going to read to you just a little bit about um, our connection and some recent things uh, that the APA is um, supporting as well. So um, recently the APA Division 16 hosted a webinar titled How to School Psych During a Pandemic, Supporting Students Through Teleconsultation. Um, and this focused on behavioral telehealth, history of telehealth, and some suggestions for supporting students, which NASP and our other organizations are doing as well. Um, some of us audience members are um, both NASP and APA Division 15 and Division 16 members, which is educational psychology and school psychology, respectively. And so we have an interesting connection with Dr. Bilius Lolas, and she is one of our trainers here in Connecticut. And she's also been nominated as Division 16 president for APA. So we thought this might be a great time to speak with her and hear about her current research and uh, about her nomination. So um, we're, we'll tell you just a little bit about her. We are all having, uh, I think, taxed internet connection issues this evening. So bear with us as, uh, as we deal with it. But um, so uh, Evelyn, I just was talking about the APA divisions, 15 and 16, educational psych and school psych, and how we have a little connection there. So uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Dr. Lolas, and then we'll turn it over to some questions and information that she has. So. Dr. Evelyn Billius Lolas is an academic researcher, writer, educational psychologist, child mental health advocate, modern woman, and seasoned car DJ and mother. <laughs> Her research and writings focus on relationships, gratitude, wellness, connectedness, positive psychology, and the promotion of compassionate learning and home environments that enable children to thrive. Dr. Lolas maintains a blog drbilias.com, that's D-R-B-I-L-I-A-S.com, um, where science meets heart. In this space, she shares creative writing that speaks to the issues of social and emotional needs of all of us as people and practitioners, not just for our students, families, and clients. Most recently, her blog posts have focused on resilience and personal growth in light of the pandemic. Evelyn's writing style is creative, fresh, and poetic while maintaining developmental perspective uh, with a professional uh, perspective as well. Her writings have been well received and her blog posts have had over 7,000 reads collectively. This has also led to Evelyn sharing a recent article for the Connecticut School Psychologist, which is our publication uh, for the Connecticut Association of School Psychologists. She's kept one foot in the academic arena and the other in clinical and educational field. And in order, in order to translate with expertise and compassionate delivery, the findings of psychological research to those who benefit from it most, our children, families, and community. So Dr. Lolas, welcome. And um, we've had a number of guests that have talked about positive psychology and school climate, um, but we haven't explored it from this lens of connectedness. So how can we as practitioners bring that research to practice gap um, using SEL and connectedness?
I think, are we can having... Can you hear me? Oh, Hi, yeah, everybody. Hear yeah. Um, I'm cutting in and out. Am I back? Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share in this conversation with all of you. I think it's no secret how much um, so many of us in the field, both in training and in practice, admire the work that you do and the thought leadership uh, that you bring. Am I out? Nope. You're still here. Can you hear me? Oh. Oh. <laughs> I think we're all um, through this pandemic learning about uh, yeah. and the internet and then co things crashing. So let's. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Hopefully that's the last time. That's okay. Um, I think what I was saying is it's no secret, um, you know, really your contribution to our field, uh, what you give so generously, the thought leadership. Um, where we all admire your work so much. So when I was invited to join today, I can't, you know, I can't say enough about how thrilled uh, and genuinely grateful I am. So thanks for that, for the opportunity to, to share this evening with you. Sure, um, thank you. My colleagues. So the question is, you know, how does social emotional learning and, and school connectedness and all these variables that we talk about during a regular year, a regular school year, us who are school-based practitioners, mental health, um, individuals in the school. We've been advocating for these things for a very, very long time. Um, and depending on our district or our school, we're told, you know, to what degree we're able to implement these things, right? So then, then you know, the pandemic happens. And, you know, in, in I think 30 seconds, uh, the whole educational system uh, was reinvigorated and reinvented and our teachers certainly, and our school staff superheroes, you know, in, in the effort that they've um, undertaken in such a short period of time to keep learning continuous. But I think one of the blessings of, if I can use that word, you know, uh, of this time is that what that allowed for is the pulling of the curtain um, and a look into what goes on in the classroom between a teacher and a student and all her students really now uh, and how that magic really is the heart and the soul of the learning environment. Now, teaching is a very private entity. Um, it's between a teacher and that classroom and, and the dynamic synergy that exists in that space. Very seldomly can you really participate or observe it as an observer, right? And so now we have COVID and everyone's remote and we have distance learning and now we have parents like myself and many of us here, right? You know, we're in the corner of a room and we can hear them. We can see them if we'd want. We see the engagement. We see the excitement. We see um, how happy they are, how authentic some of these relationships are to see their teachers or their peers. And, and it really spotlights um, what we've known for such a very long time that ultimately, you know, it's it's that relationship and it's that it, it's based in the child's perception. It's based in their own self-assessment of how valued and how validated and in their sense of belonging um, that houses really this con context for learning. And when there's a crisis, children turn to the adults, you know, in, in their lives for that kind of stability, for that composure, for to take the cue almost, um, how to act, how to behave, how to, how to grapple with things that are just so abstract and changing and in flux all the time. And, and I think what we've seen um, and, and should have, and if we were in another situation, we wouldn't see it as clearly, is that they do gravitate towards these adults in their lives. And they do seek that consistency and they do seek that relationship. And that relationship itself, that sense of, you know, I belong to this group of people. I, this, this teacher genuinely cares about me and my well-being. Um, I think all of that speaks to why and how a child is able to cope A within a crisis, you know, and, and thrive otherwise in the learning environment. Um, many times or it's been referred to in our field, and I don't need to tell you, right, you know, that this is soft. These are soft skills. No, they're not soft. Because in the time of a crisis and in the time of a frenzy, right, these are the very skills that a child needs to be able to access anything else that we expect them to do, right? It defaults right to that.
So I think that it's really an interesting time to be having this discussion um, about, you know, what is school connectedness? What does it look like? What has it looked like? And what will it look like now that we're planning ahead? Um, you know, I think the new school year is a stone throw away pretty much. And, and we're still uncertain about what it's looking like. There's so many multiple pathways that districts are in higher ed as well, you know, trying to plan to be cautious. Um, and, and all of that will have implications. Um, so it, it's in a changing face at this point. That's so powerful and beautiful. And it makes me think our conversations um, between the three of us lately have been kind of around well, there's so much uncertainty. What do we know for sure? We know for sure that relationships matter, that if students can report one trusted adult that they can count on, that they can talk to, that they can reach out to, that's a, a factor for um, resiliency and, and you know something we look for to make sure that they're okay. We know for sure that um, we know a lot about mitigating um anxiety and stress so we can measure that we can we can look to see how that is going for our kids and and also you know i think that we know about a lot about our sense of competence as as students and professionals teachers and school psychologists we know a lot about how that impacts our work and our motivation and our grit and our our uh, hope um and so those are some things that i think of that we know and that i think that we probably should measure that we should ask our kids about our teachers about what are other things that you think right now in this time of crisis that we know for sure are important and impactful and that we should look to and understand more about Right. And I think you you really just nailed it. It's it's the child's perception. It's the child's assessment, right? It's it's not what we think as adults. You know, if, if I'm an educator or I'm a school psychologist, I'm a parent or I'm a principal, and I think that my relationship with Johnny is a good one because I know that I've done on my part, you know, everything that I, I can do and that I feel close. That doesn't mean that Johnny feels the same way or to the same degree. So this notion of connectedness and this notion of that one caring adult is really the child's assessment, right? And I think that, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get to and we'll talk about, I did a little bit of work of, uh, um, in the schools with this. And it's really interesting when you compare what the adults in the building think to what the school, you know, what the kids in the building think that doesn't always line up but i think you're you're right we have to measure it we have to be able to ask you know our children our adolescents our our, our teens our college kids at this point you know for those older older children you know anywhere from middle school on especially high school on i mean they're grieving they're grieving this disruption is big this is disruption is not small for them right the social disruption and and the change of this routine the younger children it's a little bit more frustrating there's other things at hand we could still ask them and still get their sense but ultimately we want to be able to have children you know you have the vocabulary to be able to label what they feel you know and and that in this assessment or self report or we can have them scale it on a scale of 1 to 10 you know like we do when we counsel or do anything else you know we have to they have to be able to acknowledge or to um not even get acknowledged to learn we we tend to stick to the same emotional vocabulary <laughs> i think in our homes you know when we discuss our own frustrations we're happy we're mad we're sad you know we're frustrated we're anxious and it's five or six words that we use but really you know the the science of emotion there's there's so many different words that are available and and right now so many of those emotions apply right because everything that we're feeling right now as adults as children um our children as well not as children <laughs> adults as, and, and our children they're complex emotions it's it's not a, a, a un, it's not a um it's it's multi-dimensional right it's not just a one dimension of feeling we're all feeling it right there's some days you're walking outside and you're taking a nature walk with your family and you're saying wow what a glorious day and i'm, I'm getting this time with my family i normally wouldn't get and it's peaceful and then in that same day you have a shriek of anxiety because something flashes alert on your phone or you see something on the news and so all these emotions they're all like kind of sitting with you right and they're complex and i think our children need to understand that 
that is completely appropriate to have emotions that don't you wouldn't think make sense together, right? Um, you know, in the same space and time. And I don't know if you found that with your kids, right? But I think even as adults, I yeah. think we, we struggle with that. Absolutely. It's a, it's like this cascade of, you know, it, it's stormy seas, right? And we're surfing these waves, but they're just a lot bigger. They're a lot faster and more frequent than than we'd like, you know, to be able to surf. So um, I totally agree with you. And, and some of our comments here are... Um, reflecting how resonant that is for people out there. Um, yeah, so I, I'm so happy to see so many of you, about 70 of you out there tuning in. So please comment with anything, a connection that you're making, a thought that you're having, a question on your mind. You know, how, how do we do this stepwise? <laughs> One well, day at a time. Absolutely. And I think, That's you know, great. In our own reflection, in my own reflection, I know, you know, in the field that in the work that we do, we're all in our heads a lot. Right. And hopefully in our hearts just as much, too. And I think that, you know, one of the things as a parent of young children, right, for myself personally, that I've had to really find the balance is how do I stand in today? Right. And how do I stand um, it with stability during an unstable time? You know, how can I be composed and still have integrity behind like the complexity of what I feel, but still send the message to my children or my home or whomever it is that I'm interacting with? The world around us is, is unstable right now, but that doesn't mean that we are, are unstable, that, that you and I in this space, in this time, in our home. You know what? I, I think it's on a day to day, moment to moment, but that's important. That's a good question there on the on the screen. Um, and I think it speaks, you know, what kind of planning should we be doing? Um, speaks to some of the things both you and Rebecca said, Evelyn, um, mentioning the variables that we can control, the variables that we can measure, the variables that we can control. Um, we can only plan that things are gonna be difficult. We, we don't know exactly what things will look like, um, but being prepared, I think, measuring, um, people's emotions and giving kids that connectedness that um, allows us to build attachments, allows us to um, be resilient because in those attachments, we build those um, relationships that give us agency, that give us security and strength. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, in the planning, you know, when, when if you're trained as a school psychologist, if you're trained as a counselor, uh, any mental health worker, um, you're trained as a problem solver. If you're trained as an educational leader, even a teacher, teachers are leaders in their classroom. I mean, we solve problems. I mean, that's what we do. And I think that we're at this point in history where we're all solving one big problem together. There isn't a script for this. There isn't a right way right now. I mean, we, we stick to the science that we have and we have available to us, whether it's medical science, health science, psychology, what we know about resiliency, what we know, you know about all these variables that we've brought up that are all the research says it's, it's lodged right in there. You know, this, this, this works, this is good. But ultimately, we have to have the humility to know also that, you know, six, nine, one year, two years down the road from now is when we're really going to know more about what's going on right now because people are studying it now, right? So, so we have to kind of hold both of those in this, in, 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 um, one in each hand almost. What do we know? And, and what is resiliency science? And what is positive psychology tells us, tell us that works, that's important. Right. What does crisis tell us in terms of preparedness and, and planning that works, but also having the humility to say, hey, there's a lot we don't know right now, but we're just trying to solve it. And so what we do is we need to put our heads together and, and, and you know, and, and just in every school and every district, you know, work, the school psychologists, particularly now you're behind, you're also pulled from behind the curtain. So much of our work is in production, right? And now is this opportunity for um, the mental health staff and the school psychologists to tap on the shoulder of individuals who 
um, who's, you know, who you can lend some expertise and insight to, you know, and that's so crucial at this time because it's a tank of problem solving. And that's, that's, if we really want to do it with any kind of integrity, we just have to kind of acknowledge that, you know, we know what we know, but really the, a large part of this is just using problem solving, you know, and, and interdisciplinary problem solving, you know, the parents and the teachers as well. Everyone's feeling this. Everyone is feeling this. Um, um, and so, you know, how do we problem solve together? Yeah, those are such good points. And, and some of the comments here are so resonant with me as well. Um, one thing that I thought of as you were speaking is that I have had to like consistently daily work on letting go of this feeling of like, oh, I, I want to I want to like make change. I want to have control. I, I, I want to feel less helpless because there are there are you know, consistent moments, consistent days where where I, I just can't focus on that. I just need to do like the next good thing that I can do, the next Ooh. thing that I can do to add something good. And um, one of our um, viewers asks a question that I think is so important um, that, well, one about PTSD. What do we think about, you know, there's so much um, concern and worry that our kids are gonna come back to school and then with all the visual signals of uh, social distancing and masks, and are they gonna come back with trauma? And how are we gonna support them through that? And how are we gonna support them in this environment um, that is so different than what they're used to in the fall? Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, what about wrapping up this year and, and giving them a sense of, you know, you did it. We're proud of you. This was really hard. And, and you managed this distance learning and you made connections with your friends and your teachers. And, um, you know, how do we achieve some kind of closure on this school year and prepare for next school year for what the kids might be going through when they get back? And that these are excellent questions, um, you know. And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna offer not just my clinical opinion about the PTSD because I know that parents are concerned about that, uh, but I'm also gonna offer my personal opinion. So I guess that integrates both of them. Um, I I tend, you know, this this isn't the first generation in history to go through struggle, right? This isn't the first time in history America is going through struggle. And 9-11 was not that long ago. And there was a generation of kids that were afraid at that time, right? And 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 I I, I wasn't a teenager at that time. I'm sorry to spoil that. But but I was young, a young professional. And um and you know, and I remember feeling kind of similar to what I feel now. But we feel but it's been longer, right? So it's been longer at this stretch. Ultimately, I think that, you know, as a society, we're hyper focused on the labels, we're hyper focused on, um, you know, we want to do our best and our due diligence to, to offer the protective factors that we need to be resilient. That's very important. Um, and so when we look at the science of resiliency and we say that these, you know, having having connections that are authentic, you know, teaching children skills on how to identify their emotions in a non-judgmental way, right, label them and giving them the skills to cope with them, right? How we're, you know, mindfulness or gratitude or compassion and altruism. Science tells us all of these things are, have a lot of protective um a value to them, right? It, it's really hard to predict what, you know, wh what's going to happen six to nine months from now. Um, I think that if a child is safe in their home and feels for the most part, you know, that this is, you know, my hope is that, and it's so different, you know, this, this doesn't affect any family equitably, by the way, at all, right? At all. So it's so different for every family and every and depending on, you know, how close the pandemic is to you, how much it's disrupted your life, your all these other variables, demographic and so forth. But here's the thing, you know, it, it, it boils down to this, um, at least for me, because I think if I start spinning that way, then I get very anxious myself. And, and I wrote about this once. And I think this was one of the, the posts that kicked off the blog um, on the website. But I said, you know, when I was a when I was a 20 year old and I was about to or 19 and I about to enter my I was a psych pre-med. Uh, I was in labs 
all the time undergrad because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life and I didn't want to have to repeat anything. So I just did everything uh, crazy. But uh, I remember right before the year, I was going to go back in to take statistics and organic chemistry in the same year, one and two of each. Right. And I was so I was at sitting at the beach, which was my my safe haven. You know, it was it was an August day. And, and um, there was a gentleman that wasn't too far from me and he was older and he started talking to me and and basically he said he said kid he said you know worry worrying is like a rocking chair he said it gives you something to do but it gets you nowhere and and i you know i was so taken aback by that and i've never forgotten that and and what that says is we have no idea <laughs> you know what what what's going to happen in a month from now and six or nine and and i tend to be the type of person that prefers to you know i can let my mind go there trust me it does you know but i think ultimately is in if in good faith with every day we parent and we educate and we counsel to the very best of our ability and we create an environment where a child feels love where a child feels attentiveness, you know, the presence of an adult, the presence, you know, you can be there and not be present. I do that all the time. I'm terrible. You know, mom, can we eat something now? And I'm on my phone and on my computer and I'm in the same room, but I'm not present. Right. So it's, it's, uh, it's being present. It's being attentive. It's being, um, you know, it's having them feel that love, uh, all of these things, and then just teaching them the skills. To be vulnerable is not a bad thing. You know, a lot of beauty and growth comes from vulnerability. Real connection comes from, you know, vulnerability. So I think it's just trying to stay in the moment with them, right? And just give them what they need one day at a time, right? To get through that day. And I think that that's probably the best, the best course. I like what you're saying about the protective factors and, you know, what we know about resiliency. I mean, kids are very resilient. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I, of course, I wouldn't, I don't think anyone would be surprised if we see, you know, an increase in PTSD di sure. diagnoses or symptoms and things like that after that. But, but we do have to understand, too, that um, not everybody who goes through a something traumatic is going to, you know, wind up with PTSD. We do have all these protective factors and all these, all these things. And I think the majority of our kids are going to come out from this and are going to be just fine. And I think we sometimes maybe need to remind ourselves of that. But I like also what you said about how this is not going to be hitting every family the same because we've got all sorts of equity issues and kids in poverty and kids with, you know, all so much going on that can be compounding and that we need to be aware of all, all these things as school psychologists when we do get back in the buildings and before we get back in the buildings for sure. Absolutely. And, and as we get back and just to, to one one last uh, thought about how, you know, how it's going to look different for them, you know, with, you know, are they going to be are there going to be staggered school days? Is there going to be, you know, less students in a classroom? Are we going to have A and B days and half of the school comes on one day and the other half comes on the other? We're all wearing masks. You know, are we sanitizing as we walk through the door? You know, all, all of these things. Um, I think I'm going to, I'll bump right back to Rachel. I think what you said is that, yes, it's going to seem strange to them, but you know, by, by that time, they've already been dealing with strange for months. <laughs> I mean, we've been dealing with this, you know, you, you know, they go to a supermarket if you're going out there at all, or if you were even at the beginning of this, when people start, some people, you know, started wearing masks and gloves well before, um, and it, before the rest of us did, they were super cautious and you would see them walking around the grocery store or Target, you know. And so I think little by little, our children, whether it's on this, you know, the news or whether it's, you know, walking in the neighborhood, they're seeing this. So it's not going to be that unusual because we were, you know, the good thing is, and I always like to try to find as many, you know, positives as we can here. I mean, we were fortunate that this happened in the spring. We're fortunate that we had, our teachers had, so many months to build those relationships with those kids. We're fortunate that this didn't happen in the heart of the winter where it's harder to get outside and where people struggle anyway with more anxiety and depression because it's the winter time. So, I mean, this started, it displaced us in the spring. The children, the teachers know the children. You know, they've had a sense academically a fair play by, you know, by that time. And... Um, you know, we have weather, we have good weather outside. We if you live in an area that's not highly, highly populated, you know, you can take walks and do other things. So I th think our kids slowly have started to see this, you know, and it's until science catches up. That's what I tell kids and, and the teenagers that, you know, some parents have reached out to me as well. And they say, 
science needs to catch up. It's, it's done it in the past. These researchers are working their tails off, right? We don't see them in the news as much, but I mean, they're really trying to figure this out. And, you know, this isn't the first time that, um, that, that, that this something like this occurs. So I think it's, it's just kind of giving a perspective, I think is very important. That's that, really that's good. So oh, oh, go ahead, Rebecca. No, I'm just, uh, that's just resonant to me also. And I was just thinking how powerful it, it is. Go ahead, Eric. You had a yeah. thought. Um, same here. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, we're talking about connectedness and, um, and I know you have some research with school climate. So I'm wondering um, if we could talk a little bit about the research to practice gap and using SEL um, for school connectedness sort of as a vehicle. Um, and maybe to talk about some of the things we've talked about, the state maybe adopting standards and, and some of that. Right. Um, and a, thank you. That's a great question. So many people aren't familiar. This is the irony with school connectedness. You know, I was always drawn to it because I feel like as a child, that's the one factor for me that if as long as I knew I had at least one person banking on me and gratefully I did, um, I, I would take any leap you wanted me to take. I would as a kid, I would take that risk. I would take an educational risk. I would take a social emotional risk. If I knew I had somebody looking out for me that I know had my back, I would do it. And so for me, I, I, I bought into this research um, very early on. You know, school connectedness is a sub facet of school climate. But ultimately, it's so interesting that, you know, before all of this, we see CDC in the news every single day now, right? But before all this, the Centers for Disease Control got a hold of how powerful school connectedness is for your physical health, mm. for the child's physical health. And for adult, we call it social connectedness. It's just the, the child version is school, right? That it has these protective factors, not just on academics and dropout and risky behavior, but in terms of, you know, that children are less likely to use drugs or to be sexually promiscuous or to smoke, um, that it has a uh, direct correlations with having decreased anxiety and, and depression. I mean, so the Centers for Disease Control, which is a medical kind of research center, and they're looking at the medical health side of things, they invested so much money in creating documents and in getting those re that research out that says, hey, this is so important. Um, it's been there. If you Google it, I always say when I'm doing my professional, Google it. It's there. Um, you'll see that it's always been there. But for whatever reason, I think tr may, the gap that occurs between we know this to be so good for us and to what degree are we giving it a priority? To what degree can we say that, hey, you know, everybody here, we need to focus on this. So, you know, when when I started doing this, I, I, you know, I, I behave, my background is behavior, my heart is humanistic, I'm a real odd mix of things when it comes to my practice. But, you know, there's, there's strength in all of that. So when I first, you know, started doing my in the school climate work that I did at the district level um, in the Stanford Public Schools as well, um, for me, it was, PBIS, you know, it was positive behavior intervention support. It was how do we get standards in terms of what we're expecting for these kids and how do we create a structure so that they know. Um, and then from there, slowly, it, my my own scholarship kind of evolved from there when I entered academia. And um, I was called back to, uh, and, and this is the work that has really kind of catapulted, catapulted this for me. Um, I was called to do a professional development. Um, I was called in by uh, one of the principals in the Stanford Public School and their educational um, technology data person. So Matt Laskowski, hi Matt, Ellie Cousis, she is the data person at Ripple One uh, Middle School in Stanford. I was called in one summer and they were looking at their school climate data, data they normally take, right? And so it was interesting is that they they wanted to, the, made the decision to say, we need to prioritize this because, you know, we want this to be up front and center for our, our students in addition to all their academic um, all their academic goals. And they, you know, I, I, I was invited to come in to do two professional developments, 
That was the plan initially. I came in in the fall, I came in in the spring. I introduced school connectedness, what it is. I made them bring their class rosters to the PD. I'm, I had the adults align themselves with, with, with every period and every child according to their um, teams, looking at you know what kid comes up on no one's list as the adult perceiving the connection, which still doesn't matter because it ultimately it's the kid's version that really matters. But at least it's a start. And then in the in the spring, I came back and um, we talked about um, practices, practices change in adult practice that would lead you know to more connectedness. And so as a result of this work, now that has been a two th almost yet yeah, two year plus relationship, it just kept on blossoming. And and what we ultimately did and when you ask how do you bridge that gap number one you need to have it take up a space on the piece of paper in the school improvement plan it has to take a place that says we have to focus on this and this is how we're going to do it we're going to educate our community which includes our students our faculty our parents on what this is and why it's important that's the first step and then at, you know we're going to devote and this is what they did they devoted plc time to this work. They devoted team meeting time to this work. I mean, they were thinking about this as a community and as a school, and I would come in throughout the year and we would talk about what the data was looking at like and so forth. We recently just presented about this at, at the NASP convention and they joined me, which was wonderful. A um, bunch of school psychs and 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 um, they were troopers to to be in the party, I guess. Um, but ultimately it's, it's, that's how it began. It began because in my opi opinion, there was a leader in place and you know, a couple of people in the building that really got it. And that said, okay, this isn't fluff. This isn't something that's good practice. This is something that we're going to put down and that the school is going to know about. So, so that's the first step. And then it's, you know, you have to create in your own building with your own faculty based on the climate of that school and based on the dynamics of that school. So there's not one blanket answer, Eric. I wish I could give you one, but ultimately it's not a blanket. It's it's thinking about the climate of that building and thinking about the relationships on three different levels, right? The teacher and the child, uh, the teacher and the other teacher. So teacher, teacher, um, teacher, student, and then student, student. What is the climate? What is the temperature of all those relationships. That will give you a really good sense of what the school's like. And then from there, figure out strategically in a three-year plan to say, okay, year one, we'll be happy at the end of the year if we do this, X, Y, and Z. Introduce it, um, do some real deep thinking and digging for it, bring it to our teams, let us identify the students who they call them priority, priority students because they haven't. And then at the end of the year, they would take the school climate data that they had, which they ask every year, the survey that goes out and see what are the students saying and how does it compare to what the teachers are saying? So we're thinking about that and then tweaking it from there. So that would be one good place to start if this isn't a priority in a school. Um, what's going to be different about it? And this is the part, to be quite honest, that, um, you know, it has me thinking and I, I feel uncomfortable is, um, you know, if you make distance learning, if we're remote from day one, you know, at the start of next year and teachers don't have a former relationship with this new group of students, that's going to be interesting to really think about. So we need to put our problem solving hats on there. Older kids, they're used to the camera. They TikTok, they, you know, they, whatever they do, Instagram and their stories and this and that. And so being able to create a relationship this way for them, that's going to be a little more okay up their alley. But the little kids, you know, you can't put them in front of the computer for hours of a day. Like it, it, you can't have a, a, a Zoom or a Google chat of 30 of them. And, you know, like we were fortunate this happened in, in mid-March for us. Right. So I think that as school psychologists, as anybody who's in the mental health um, uh, school based practice or, you know, our leaders, too, and our teachers, we need to think about how are we going to intentionally now really um create this sense of connectedness with our students if we're starting from a place where we don't know them as well. That's the tough one. Yeah, that's going to be a huge challenge, I think. Um, oh, uh, Rachel, do you want to go ahead with your question? We have a good question on 
I just noticed a, a good one here, um, or a comment and question. Um, so PBIS was introduced in the district. One school did excellent and another it failed. How does school culture influence its success? So SEL is now a priority in the schools. Um, so I think that that just speaks to kind of what you said about it. It's so different at different schools and what schools need. And um, I just thought it's Absolutely. And, it, and, and here's the thing, and it's figuring out how to make it work in your school. You know, many times I remember when I was a, a school psychologist right out of grad school, you know, ultimately I'd, I still think I am, but nonetheless, like super twinkles in the eyes, couldn't wait to get into practice. Um, and I was, I remember sitting at um, a PPT meeting and suggesting something. Uh, and they said, well, we've tried that before and that just doesn't work. And I said, then we haven't found the right way to try it because the research says it works. <laughs> so we just have to figure out how we make it work for us. <laughs> and I think, you know, I think that is the takeaway. How do we make it work for us? How do we make it wor work for that particular school? So it, there's a lot of research on um, in implementation barriers, right? And, and that, that literature exists. So if you, if you, if you're in that one building that's struggling, I would definitely reach out to that literature base and say, okay, where are we rating on here and where is it? I think the leadership is critical. I think, you know, anytime you have a principal, assistant principal, that if they get, if they really get mental health, you're, you're head and shoulders above. You know, I remember one of, um, when I was a practitioner at the high school, that's where I began. I remember we had this one whole, or, you know, we had this one crisis they can never prepare you for. Okay, I won't go into it, but I remember it. And the, and it was a crisis and a discipline issue, hand in hand, right? And I remember, like, you know, we had everybody called. The ambulance was there, the police was there. You know, everybody was there. And um, and I remember the principal coming into me, and she literally said to me, "Let's just take care of this kid, and we'll deal with the discipline part later." And I and I said a prayer inside myself. I said, thank God she gets it. She gets it because, the, you know, yes, we're going to have to deal with that part later. But she understood that right now the state safety and stability of the child is the number one thing. And so that's why I said, I think our leaders, if we can get it from the, the leaders and if the mental health team can be advocates really for, for everyone. And right now, you know, the teachers are hurting. I saw it come up on a comment. Teachers are stressed. The parents are stressed. Parents are teachers and parents now, you know, and maybe professionals all in one day in one living room, dining room or wherever you're doing your work from these days. But, you know, everyone is feeling that feeling stretched thin. Um, so I think it's just we need to reach out to one another. Um, and, and, and just psychoeducate, you know, those of us that are in the field and those of us that are, you know, trained in counseling and psychology and school psychology, this is the time, this is the time people are listening. I think why my blog, I've been writing, I'm wanting to write for such a long time, but I think why it took off when it did is because people want, this is what they, they, they're, they want to read, they want to listen um, right now. And so we have people's ears as a field. You know, and, and what I love about school psychology, and this is personally why I chose it, this was my branch, right? Educational psychology, because it covers every other branch of psychology <laughs> in there, right? I mean, we, we can take from all of these other expertises and collaborate them, but we see everything in the school, everything. And so ultimately, I think we have we have to co collaborate with one another, with other professionals that are in the in the field, in, you know, in the psychology field, in the medical fields and and really just psychoeducate, teach people about what we know and, and, and then, you know, help them work through the rest of it. And, and, you know, that's in the home and that's at school. That's really everywhere at this point. Yeah, that's a really good thought. We're seeing some some good uh, people just chiming in with the the exhaustion is palpable. <laughs> you know, the um, little ones are tired after short periods of time, and um, it, it's it's just we need to reconnect with ourselves, reconnect with others. Um, and I, I think um, as educators, I'm wondering, you know, we we're just talking about how to implement certain things and implementation barriers. Um, what are some ways that we can, as educators, parents, practitioners, uh, maybe integrate school connectedness across some of these um, systems, across some of these tiers? I don't know if that went through. 
I think I think the internet is. So this, internet, I, I don't. Yeah. Like, can you still hear me? I think I'm having oh, a connectivity yeah, issue. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> Maybe not. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. <laughs> all right. I think she's frozen. Okay. But I, I, yeah, I'm I'm seeing lots of good comments, kind of all along the lines of what we were saying. Um, let me read this one out. Um, yeah. Households that are struggling and so don't get the support for distance learning from their family. Totally understandable. Mm -hmm. um, how can we make SEL branch into an entire household and be relevant to all with the end game to help families normalize and keep education a priority? That's like the million dollar question, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we're trying yeah. to get back. Here it in. comes. There. Hey. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I'm just reading some of the comments. Um, um, so just before you, um, your internet or our internet's all collectively sighed, <laughs> um, I was just asking what are some ways that perhaps parents, educators can integrate school connectedness together across tiers? Maybe we're still having. A little bit, can you hear me? Yes. So you can hear me okay. Um, yeah. Okay, terrific. So what I think we need to do is be super intentional at this point. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that we're about to change the landscape of education. It's changing. We're all going to be a part of that. Um, so we need to understand that some of the learning may take place in the home next year. Not fully, not every day all the time, but there might be a period. We have to be ready for that where, you know, maybe – the fall looks okay or we have some staggered plan and then you know next winter there might be a little distance learning thrown in again you know we, we have to be ready for anything in terms of you know until the science catches up um but what we need to do is be very intentional and in our collaborations with the home and the school as best we can now this isn't possible for all kids you can't always reach those parents i know that you know my friends who are educators and, and teachers and principals they're saying you know there's a list of kids that we keep on trying to connect with we keep on trying to get them to engage they haven't signed on yet or so forth so you know we have to again we have to take those cases and and, and really strategically think about them as well but generally speaking i'll speak to the general for this for this question we need to think of a plan and it, it probably has to be a little bit creative as well um what are the things that we can do to help a child assimilate into a new it's an assimilation i use that word that's actually quite funny that i use that word but assimilate into um you know this new territory this new territory of education um, how do we help them assimilate into that environment uh, w based on what we know? You know, how do we help forge relationships more intentionally if if we're not going to have as much, uh, no pun intended, face real FaceTime um, and it's going to be more remote? Like, what are the activities that we know and, and that we can do that can help a child connect or feel valued, um, you know, both in their home and at, and at school. Some of this will be collaboration with the parents and, and you know, kind of a little bit of coaching that we, we can do, certainly, um, in terms of strategies and other things that might help. But also, it's just, um, I think if everybody puts it on their radar that we're going to focus on this because ultimately this is the one thing that's going to keep us cool in the face and calm in the face of distress and anxiety. You know, this is the one thing that, you know, we can keep consistent. We can keep it consistent because it's invisible, right? It doesn't have to do with the building itself. We learned that this year. It's invisible. It's the invisible string that ties us to one another, that ties these relationships together. And so now we know it's not just hanging out in the school or in the buildings or that. No, it's more about making sure that we fight for that string. We have to fight for it. And so how do we do that? You know, we have to psychoeducate people. Like I said before, we have to think about creative ways to have children working together, to have them working with certain adults. Um, we have to be very intentional in the strategies that we promote. You know, how do we help people get to know one another? What are fun and lighthearted ways that would allow, you know, we, we, it doesn't have to be heavy all the time. You know, and, and I think a lot of us are feeling, and, and, I, and I can definitely speak to my parent friends, right? Heaviness, heaviness. That's, that's the majority of the feeling. But I think it's so important that we have to make time and find avenues to create lightness 
in that. And in those moments of lightness, lightheartedness, silliness, you know, those relationships are also taking form, right? Um, and so it's going to involve creativity, you know, and it's going to involve uh, collaboration between the home and the school like it's never been before. You know, we've always advocated for it, but now like the parent is a teacher more than they've ever had to be a teacher, right? Um, I don't know if I answered, did I answer the question uh, thoroughly? I can go, you know, I just, it, I think so much of it is, we, is is yet to be determined, but I think that the commitment needs to be that when we're planning for, you know, fall 20, we with intention, we're planning one of the number one things on that, you know, school plan for reintegration and reentry is how are we going to forge and sustain these connections regardless of where we are, you know, and how long we're there. That's so important. And we have lots of comments in the chat about um, social emotional learning and forging those connections as a priority. And I think, you know, of course, schools are meant to educate and academics are a huge priority, but we can't even get there if we if it's not for, you know, strong connections and bonds and relationships and, you know, just the well being of our kids. So all of that that you said, I think is so important. Thank you. Yeah, um, I know we're we're running uh, short on time, and and uh, we had a little message on Facebook for people to chime in with last minute questions. Um, we this has been fantastic, and I I want to acknowledge the the honor that you received in nomination for APA uh, Division sixteen president, and wanted to just chat with you a little bit about that as well. Um, what, what does that mean? Um, many of our members are NAS members and some of us are members of both, um, APA division 16 and, um, and NAS. So, um, what do you think about it and, and what might you think that look might look like? It's certainly going to be challenging, um, you know, having the, this new landscape for education. Right. Well, thank you for saying that. And, and, you know, the honor, the nomination is the honor in and of itself. I was, I'm very humble. I'm very humbled by it, and um, and, and excited if if that is you know what is meant for me. You know, at this point in time, um, I welcome it. And also, you know, it, you said that it's it's challenging, but it's also exciting because what excites me is innovation. What excite, excites me is thought leadership. It's, it, you know, it's being able to have a platform that allows you to then um, really integrate all that we know um, about just not just psychology, psychology and learning, um, all that we know uh, about our field and how for such a long time in school psychology, we've been um, working so hard to be visible, right? And now we're so visible. Oh boy, like we're in a spotlight, I think, with the pandemic in terms of where our mental health people and how important they are. And I think so in this opportunity that, you know, that we're redesigning and reimagining and, and, and taking close stock really of um, of what our, our learning landscape is going to look like. I think that, you know, being able to work closely, you know, with, um, you know, leaders, uh, you know, at, at the you know, with legislation, with leaders, uh, with other constituents in the APA, other divisions, because like I said, for me, school psychology, that's a little bit of just about everything there. And there's expertises that could be welded together to help us collaboratively, you know, problem solve and, and get to, you know, a new direction and, and, and do it in a way that, you know, what many people who aren't school psychologists and mental health providers may not be aware of is that a lot of what we do, you know, we have a lot of, eth there's, there are ethical guidelines behind what we're doing. You know, it's, it's, we can't just test a kid through a computer and, you know, screen them for, or, you know, any, I mean, you can do it, but, but, but schools typically don't do it that way. Right. And so there, this is introducing a, a, a lot of unknowns and a lot of um, discussion, you know, in various facets of the system. And I think that there needs to be a couple of things, right. There needs to be uh, the ability to listen very intently, you know, to what is needed. There needs to be moral courage to kind of be able to assert with, you know, with professionalism and compassion, uh, why, our field needs to be visible and, and how do we maintain the integrity, right, of, of our work 
and what we do and the safety of our kids, because ultimately, if we don't maintain the integrity of what we do, then their safety is at risk in one way or another, right? So all that is hand in hand. Um, so I think that that you know the uh, that opportunity would provide me you know, provide me the opportunity to meet some really neat people and to collaborate and have these really deep discussions and and problem solve. Personally, also, I would love um, to be you know very. I would be very committed um, to really recruiting um, and and trying to recruit and support uh, diverse school psychologists. You know, I, I, that's a that's to me right now. I think the as many models as we can get in there, and you know, and, and it, how to create opportunities that will allow our field to continue to flourish and to be you know to be leaders, um, but also to you know to provide you know to provide that opportunity to as many people as we can, and and sometimes it you know it means to to be able to actually recruit it. You know, I didn't know what a school psychologist was when I was in college or high school. I didn't even know that existed. Um, right. So I, I think sometimes it, it involves this networking and these conversations and someone who knows someone who may be great and tapping that person on the shoulder and then and then creating systems within, you know, within our uh, community that allow for, you know, for access, you know, for adults thinking of another career, you know, you know, that have to then, you know, if you're training to be a school psychologist, there's a year of called internship and it doesn't pay you. <laughs> you know, that that's a hard thing. So, you know, trying to figure out not just the cost of the education, but also how does someone sustain themselves and what's, you know, how, how do we make this happen for people? I think these are, you know, and this, you know, we want to be re recruiting high quality um, graduate students and we want them to, I, to re recruit, you know, a, as diverse of a pool as we can. Um, having sites that are also, you know, very reputable and rich and, and you know, the, having placements for our students, I think is super important. So these are just, you know, these are just a few things. Um, but I think it would provide, you know, the timing of it is really interesting at this time. And I, you know, I'd be invigorated by the opportunity to represent us. I really would. Uh, I would do it with all my heart. And, uh, and, and, you know, I'm a, and always open enough, enough to collaborate and to, you know, to listen. Um, that's how I work. Um, but we'll see. That's fantastic. And congratulations. What a, what an amazing honor. And, um, and just to hear you talk about this, your passion is so clear and your direction and sense of purpose and organization of thought, um, response to so many things going on have, have just been clear. So that just, you come across as a strong leader in that respect, but also, um, compassionate and empathic and, and down to earth. So, um, so, APA will be fortunate to have you. <laughs> yeah. And we need to oh, I appreciate as psychologists that. be visible throughout this too, just I feel mm -hmm. because yeah, the budget cuts are coming <laughs> and right. we need to, you know, what we do is important and mental health is important. And um, I'm a little bit nervous, honestly, that positions are gonna get cut and, and things just because, you know, if we're going into a recession or a depression, um, cuts need to be made somewhere. And so um, I think that we need people to advocate for our field and our profession to make sure that we, we're still there and we're still present and available for to help students. Um, I saw uh, a last- And we know how to present the data too, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we know how to put that data together and deliver that baby, you know, and I think that that's what we need to continuously do, you know, make it pretty and deliverable. Mm -hmm. um, I know we had a question from Sue, just wanting some quick tips on making connections for those of us who might not be back in person. What are your thoughts on that? If we're not back in person, how are we connecting? As school psychologists and, and mental health workers, is that what I'm, okay. I think so. And, and I think so. So this is, you know, this is just, um, I'm, I'm thinking out loud at this point, but ultimately your caseload is your caseload. And, you know, you definitely want to be able to make individual connections, which you will with your caseloads. That's super important. Those are the kids that we know already, that they have been already identified. They're already, at, you know, uh, needed in the supports and we just have to continue. So the, the good news is the large majority of your caseload, depending on where you are, you probably know in terms of IEPs because you're just not going to know the incoming and you're, you know, right, the incoming. Everybody else is moving up, 
right? So it's, so you have to then, you know, be creative in the, you know, if you're in an elementary school and those kindergarten kids that are coming in, if you're in a middle school, it's those sixth graders, if you're at the high school, it's the ninth graders, you know, do, you have to be a little bit more intentional about those kids because you don't know them at all. And if they're on your caseload, then you have to really, you know, maybe once a week reaching out to them is not the way to do it initially. Maybe it's smaller sessions, maybe it's twice or, you know, it's the check in, check out model, or maybe it's, you know, two smaller sessions at 25 minutes each or so forth. I mean, you have to be very, you know, intentional about how you reach out to those kids and, and start to get to know them. So that's one thing. Um, I think the, the, the harder question is the new, the, the kids that are not IEP, the kids who do not receive the services, the kids who would otherwise be your walk-ins or your referrals, we might see more of those. So then, so we have, the, and so that, is you know depending on where the field and what and where our our guidelines tell us what we're allotted to do and what the school districts are allowing for their school psychologists to do whether it's I know some districts aren't allowing them at this point I think to even counsel just uh, do social emotional learning or it, I think it varies and I think people are afraid and I don't blame them because they this has never happened before so it's logical that everyone's going to approach this a little differently but come the fall we need to have a plan you know about how we approach it so um, those new referrals those kids that you know may have been at risk or may have, have been subclinical all this time and now they're just they're at a level where they need to be seen I think that they're you know we need to create um a referral process if your school doesn't have one like among your teachers and and your staff to says okay you know we're all seeing these kids remotely you know what's going to be our process for and maybe it's a piece of paper sometimes that helps you know um you know what, what's our process for making that referral you know what are the indicators that would warrant that's a good well, actually got that just came to me what are the indicators that would warrant a referral I think if you could put a few things down, right, and, and put a little checkbox next to it, I think that's one way to start the conversation. So if everybody in the school has this, now they can say, oh, okay, I saw Johnny on Zoom the other day, and, um, you know, I saw this, this doesn't seem like him, so forth, uh, it, it will help. Does that make sense? I mean, I just thought of that out loud, but I think that it, it just needs to be uniform. Get your school, um, give them one form or so, one way, give them a little help. Um, and just, you know, for those are the, for the ones that, you know, you might get the parent that's gonna reach out to you and say, can you please you know, talk to my kid? Those are the easy ones. That's easier because somebody is saying it. The more subtle are, 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 are be, like, just like we do now, it's the person that's gonna notice a change in behavior. It might even be a subtle change. Right. So it's going to be both of those things. And then I think we had some questions. Yeah. About um, yeah. what about those of us who are in a, in a role that maybe we're just historically evaluating and testing mm -hmm. and if we're not doing that or doing that. And kind of how, how do we broaden our role? I, I think Is that's that a great question. That's a great question. Um, because, you know, one of the caveats of, of our, our profession is that, you know, that they, there's, it's so multifaceted and, 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 you know, we can to some degree, you know, so hopefully it's our choice. Sometimes, you know, it's a mold. But um, I think that ultimately what we need to do is then you, you have a, a peer group, right? So I would reach out to, to your peer group, whether it's within your district, you know, if it's the school psychologists and the mental health workers in your district, whether it's your association at the state level, you know, I think we need to think about like co-mentoring at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that would make a lot of sense because if I'm, if my strength is, you know, um, social emotional learning, if my strength is consultation, my strength is counseling and, and yours is testing, then there's no reason that we can't connect in some way. And I can't, you know, you know, offer my insight and, and you shed your insight into like, cause testing is going to look a little different too. I, I, I couldn't, I don't think we're, it's that we're not going to be doing it. We might not be doing certain parts of it. 
So I think that this is the time where we really need to um, to lean on these professional relationships, to lean on them. Um, lean on your schools, your, your, your training institutions too. We keep in touch with our students at Fairfield, um, our alum, who are like family. And so, you know, it's never, you, you can, and I, and I feel the same way about the institutions that prepared me. I can hit, I could text someone in a minute, you know? Mm -hmm. So lean on those relationships professionally because everybody is figuring it out all at the same time. And this is what we need right now is we, you know, and one of the, one of the, you know, I think one of the things we see time and time again in a time of crisis is this tremendous um, altruism, this tremendous mm -hmm. generosity of spirit that just comes, emerges. So I don't think, you know, someone would really shut you down if you said, can, you know, can you help me? Right. Yeah, that's so well said. I, I think, you know, one of the things we've talked a lot about is we're a community. You know, that's why we do this. We, none of us is as skilled as all of us is sort of this model that. that we've adopted. And, and so we're all in this together, you know, reaching out to one another, relying on each other for tips and advice and support. Mm -hmm. And um, it's crucial. You know, we're, we're educators together. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. We're school psychologists together. And we use that word thrive, right? And we are helping children thrive. We're helping each other and parents and families and other educators too. So yeah. um, can I yeah. make one more? I just don't want yeah. to use it. Um, I, I wanted to make, so one insight that I've had in, you know, every professional development that I've ever, ever done, you know, with teachers or, or workshop with parents. And I think it would be so um, useful to, to, you know, I think our field at, at this time is that ultimately when there's an issue that you're trying to present about or where there's an issue that you're, you know, you're, you're called in to grapple with on a large scale meeting to a group of people um, or individually to a smaller scale, but more so to a large scale, kind of like what we're dealing with right now is, um, um, is sorry about that. We're not being video bombed, so that's good. Um, that usually happens too. Uh, is that we need um, people just want to know what to do, folks. You know, it, it, we know we know the theory, we know the constructs, we know the research. That's great. Distill it and 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 deliver it in a way that just gives them really concrete. Like, what do I do? Because I think sometimes like we love the theory. We love it. That's why we, we studied it. That's why we're here. Right. That's why we understand all these different theorists and all these different literature bases. And and our, I think our responsibility right now is to make sure that we're pulling from all of that and serving it so elegantly. Right. And so t tangibly like this, you know, give people tangible skills right? Tangible things that they can look to or that they can read or that they could practice, but tangible on the ground. We need to be on the ground as much as we can. And I think that that, that our parents and our, our educators and, you know, I think even our colleagues, I think they'd, they'd be very grateful for that. Because I think we're all at bandwidth. Attention wise, by the way, we're all at bandwidth. Our attention capabilities, right? So a lot yeah. of, that, right, right, exactly. We're at bandwidth. What? So Filter that out, folks. That's great. We know it. Just give them what they need, right? That's, That's great. True. And I just wanted to say this moment, this time between us and all of you out there has been such a powerful moment of connection for me. And so I think that while we're thinking about how to make these connections with students, with our communities, faculty and parents, we should also remind ourselves that this connection, this bond between each other is so important too, so fulfilling and so nurturing to our work in our school. So let's keep going because it's it makes such a difference. That's great. And I think, um, you know, people were asking some questions that we might not have gotten to. Um, the conversation can continue. So um, we're all here on social media. Dr. Bilius is on social media. And um, she has her website that we mentioned. So please reach out, um, continue the conversation. Um, the, the thread that's going on below this video can continue as well on Facebook. So, um, and as people were mentioning a couple of questions about social and emotional learning, um, there's a great website, uh, sorry, Facebook page, um, Social and Emotional Learning in Education. And it's just full of resources where people from all 
um, facets of education are sharing social and emotional supports. Um, so check it out. Our friend, Dr. Byron McClure has um, uh, lessons for SEL also and has some great resources. So check his Facebook page out as well. Um, but we're grateful to have you on this evening, uh, Evelyn. And um, we have our next podcast in two weeks on a Sunday, um, which will be Amanda, Dr. Amanda Vander Hayden talking about math interventions. And that'll be on June 7th. <laughs> we'll have one more after that for our season. And you'll see us <laughs> in between, I'm sure, too. So, uh, But the comments, um, just everyone is just feeling, I think, you know, as Rebecca said, and I would say the exact same thing, like just so connected and um, you spoke to all of us um, thank you. in a wonderful way tonight. Thank so we, for we the, appreciate you know, it. For this opportunity and thank you really for what you're doing. And you're doing it just from the generosity of your hearts. I mean, you're taking all of your personal time and, and you know, I have been following and Rebecca, especially like for, from when you started your, um, your, where did you start? Was it Twitter or was it, it was Twitter? No, it was Facebook. It I was Facebook. My I remember phone. telling all of my students, you need to follow her, follow her on Twitter, follow her anywhere. You know, and, and here it is, is this, you know, and, and making such an impact across the nation, right? And and, and Eric and, and Rachel, all of you, and, and doing this from like, from, from your free time, because you're passionate about our field, because we love what we do, and, and, and we want to make the world go round. And I'm just so grateful for that and for your presence. It, it's a commitment. You know, people hire people to do this stuff, right? It's a commitment to do the whole shebang by yourself, right? So thank you for all that you're doing and for all the information that you bring to us, you know, um, across across the seniority levels and across the ages. So, so, so very grateful to you, too. Aw. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us for sure. It was an awesome discussion. And, um, you know, everybody have a good evening and we'll get back to it tomorrow. And uh, we <laughs> hope to, to see you guys um, in about two weeks or so on Sunday for math. So stay well, everyone. Yeah, stay well.